Good morning. My name is Mylene Paterna Loxin, and I've been asked to speak to you today about promoting literacy in the home. Like you, I'm a teacher. So when the whole country went into lockdown and schools shut down, I worried. I worried about how I could carry on teaching my high school students online. And then when I saw how difficult that was, I worried about the little children. Because I'm a reading teacher, I worried particularly about the six-year-olds who would be deprived of the chance to learn to read. I wondered if reading can be taught remotely, how we could make up for the lack of access to books and instructional material. And I asked myself what, as an individual, I could do. This led to a small project that I'll talk about later. On hindsight, it was a good opportunity for me to consolidate my thoughts and experiences as a reading and language teacher, to step back and try to see the big picture. We don't often get this chance. But in order to answer my first question of whether it's possible to teach reading remotely, I had to ask another question. What makes a good reader? What is the relationship between language and literacy? Do good language skills always translate to good reading skills? Think about how we acquire language. We don't have to teach it. Children will acquire language naturally, given a good linguistic environment, and sometimes they don't even need that. The best thing about language is that children acquire their language skills before they step into formal school. A one-year-old child will know maybe two words, but by the time that child is three years old, they will know 1,000 words. And by the time they are five or six years old, they will know 5,000 or 6,000 words. Not only that, language development experts tell us that a five-year-old knowing 5,000 words will have enough language to keep on growing because language growth is exponential. The more you know, the faster you will gain more language. Apart from a large vocabulary, that child will also know the different functions of language. They can use it for socialization and interaction, for playing games, for detecting rhyming patterns and songs. They will be able to follow instructions, tell a story, listen to a story. They will be able to ask questions. They might even be able to tell a joke. But reading's different. Most children do not acquire reading skills on their own. Reading needs to be taught. It's a complex process requiring phoneme grapheme association, phonemic segmentation, fine motor skills for writing letters. And reading instruction doesn't stop, stop with teaching decoding because sometimes we have good decoders who can't cross over into reading for meaning. Why? We have students who will score high on reading tests in grades one and two, and then we'll see those scores plummet in grades four and five. And again, the question is, why? I didn't have any answers. So I did what every self-respecting 21st century person would do. I went online. I looked up the work of an old grad school professor, Catherine Snow. I knew that she'd been doing research on language and culture, bilingualism and multilingualism, and language and literacy. I found two interesting articles that seemed to answer my question. In the first article, published in the Harvard Educational Review in 1983, Snow begins by stating, and I quote, although working class and minority children may use language differently than middle class children, they are not deficient in language ability. Underline as mine. But she continues, social class differences in reading achievement persists. Why? The article goes on to look at language development and literacy development. Both require complex mapping of form into meaning. But whereas language happens naturally, with high success, all children develop language, literacy development requires explicit teaching 
and carries variations in success. But then Snow offers another finding that I hadn't considered. Language skills achieved naturally by children are highly contextualized. This means, I think, that it's often very concrete. It derives from immediate surroundings. It's learned from social interaction and relationships. Literacy skills, on the other hand, are decontextualized, meaning that they're more abstract, that a, that a story in a book, for instance, may not be happening in a child's home with characters he doesn't know. Or a mother might tell a story that happened when she was a child long ago, separated by time outside of the child's current context. Snow argues that, and I'll quote from the article, the existence of individual differences in literacy skills does not differentiate literacy from language. Rather, any skills which must be acquired or applied in a decontextualized way, whether that be reading, writing, talking, or listening, will be difficult, require some instruction, and show individual differences. She concludes that article saying that because most literacy experiences are by nature decontextualized, we'll always get that difference in fluency. In a subsequent publication in 1991 in the Journal of Research in Childhood Education, Snow consolidates that theory in this model of relationships between language and literacy development. I don't know if you've seen this model before. It identifies four domains of skills developed between ages three to six, conversational language skills, decontextualized oral language skills, print skills, and emergent literacy skills. The arrows indicate that literacy outcomes in kinder and grade one are probably strongly related to preschool print skills, learning letters and letter sounds, phonemic segmentation, etc. Whereas literacy outcomes in grade four, when students are asked to read to learn, are more strongly related to oral decontextualized language skills. So I think that answers our previous question of whether good language skills always translate to good reading skills. And the answer is only to a certain extent. It seems that it's the experience with oral decontextualized language that boosts reading comprehension. So if we want to promote literacy in the home, we need to push for decontextualized language. How to do this? One easy way is through story. That's my favorite way. Stories, if they're not about partic that particular child in that particular situation, are always decontextualized. They will happen in different places to characters they don't know or meet only in the story. And they'll require the children to follow events that they may never have experienced themselves. Another way is to have discussions on school topics continue in the home. Help families use technology to access information by sending home links to websites or videos on topics you're discussing in science or math or social studies. Or get parents to expand on items of information. If they're cooking, for instance, they might want to talk about the price of onions which might lead to discussions of supply and demand or of importation or support for local farmers. Here's the last thing. Remember my first question of whether beginning reading can be taught remotely? I'll ask for your indulgence as I talk a little bit about my lockdown project. Some teacher friends and I thought of a project that might help bring books into people's homes. We thought of creating small books with simple text, about 150 words, and black and white drawings so they could be printed out back to back using two sheets of bond paper. 
Here are two samples of the books. Anyone can access these books by joining a Facebook group called Books for Readers Big and Small. Right now, we have just over 25 titles on the site, each title in English and Filipino. We'll keep adding more. Eventually, we hope to get the books translated into other Philippine languages, upload them on the site, and keep the open access going. That's the dream. So that's it. If you have any questions, I'll be around to discuss them with you. Thank you for listening and good morning.